Okay, we're in our last session. And so we want to make sure that, uh, how's everybody doing? Just like, make sure you're awake. Just, just, just get, 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 all right. Now I know we got, uh, we got some people still outside, but uh, we will start in 10 minutes. So if you know anybody who's outside, we'll start in 10 minutes. That's why I said 10 minutes. I'll just make sure everybody's listening. So we'll start in five minutes uh, while we're waiting. If you have not filled out your evaluations, make sure you fill out your evaluations. And if you see anybody in the hallway, we're going to be closing the door soon. So again, take the time to turn off your cell phones, Blackberries, and other noise-making devices. We can get those uh, back doors closed, please. We're going to start up uh, our next session. Yes, sir.
So before we get started, uh, it has been brought to my attention that someone has lost something. So if you are missing anything, we will take it to the green room. So wave your hand if you're missing a purse, a wallet, winnings from, anyway. So uh, if you're missing anything, we'll have it over here in the green room. So please make your way over there. Is she waving her hand because of something or? Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, to start off this afternoon, I'm going to introduce uh, General Burks, and he, prior to, will uh, make some announcements, and then he will be introducing our guest speaker, our final speaker, who's going to take us down the rest of this mountain. So this time, let's give our conference hosts a big hand, because you got to make sure those cookies aren't sitting on your stomach. God, I hate falling on Andre. Um, anyway, uh, nobody can throw a conference out without having a conference staff. And this next portion, is, uh, this next portion before we get into our final speaker, is to honor the folks that have uh, made this all possible. Um, God knows I didn't do it. And so, anyway, we just wanted uh, General McKinley left a bunch of coins to uh, pass out to the people that volunteered their time and their effort to make this everything that it is. So with that, we'd like to uh, bring them up and we'll go ahead and coin them for General McKinley. Now, obviously, that wasn't every because we still have guards out there, so we're going to be giving um, Lieutenant Colonel Flores uh, coins for the rest of his team. But um, let's just give it up to them all again. Okay. We've been on quite a journey for the last day and a half, haven't we? You thought about diversity in the last day and a half. <laughs> I don't know how you couldn't have. Um, this afternoon's speaker is somebody that I met for the first time about six months ago. Uh, a very dynamic woman uh, who, in her part time, also is one of Santa's elves. And I'll explain that to you. And I don't say that to be funny or anything else. I, got, I received a call in Carson City about a secret Santa down in Las Vegas. The secret Santa, we'll say, is somebody like Mr. Wynn. He donated a million dollars to needy families. And part of that went to Nevada guardsmen living in the greater Las Vegas area. At the time, we had our 422nd Signal Battalion deployed, of which over 50 of them, or 60 of them, were living in the greater Las Vegas area who were unemployed. What that million dollars resulted in was $2,500 gift cards, and they were given to the families of Project Head Start, and about 110 of them went to members of the Nevada National Guard. 60 of them were part of the 422nd, the other 50 or so 
went to people that were also unemployed in the Nevada Guard down in the greater Las Vegas area. That's how I met this woman. Um, since then, um, she has gone out on her own. I'll read her bio here in a little bit. But um, you need to know that she's a very dynamic woman and has a long history in this field. Her name is Poonam Mather. She operates her own business as a speaker, a trainer, and a writer. From 2009 to 2012, she was an officer for, some people call it Nevada Energy, some people call it NV Energy. Um, school, I call it Nevada Energy, which was a vertical integrated company that actually it was two utility companies, Nevada State Power and Sierra Pacific Power Company that merged and they became NV, NV Energy or Nevada Energy, whatever you want to call it. They have about 2,700 employees. Um, two of them were my uh, assistant adjutant generals, both vice presidents uh, for the company. Uh, one has since retired from the guard, the other one's sitting in uh, the room here. Um, where Poonam was actually the vice president of people resources and as vice president of employee and community engagement. Prior to joining Nevada Energy, she worked for the MGM Mirage, or now the MGM Resorts. And under that, she brought that company many diversity awards as a corporation is recognized throughout the country for her efforts. So with that, I'd like to bring Poonam up to the stage and uh, let her start her spiel. Great lady. He's my favorite tag ever. <laughs> Where's the theme? The theme is in pursuit of greatness through diversity. I come bearing good news on greatness. I know, I know. Twice, I know I've seen greatness. Once, on any playground in the world. On any preschool playground in the world, there is greatness. Think about those playgrounds. Little people, endless in their potential, vibrant in their capability to love, to forgive, to communicate, to support, to rejoice, to dare, to dream. Greatness on any playground in this world. And you know, I'm a parent three times over and I actually remind my kids all the time that my job as their parent, I believe, is to mess them up because I believe that's what parents do. My, my, my commitment to my children is to mess them up as little as I possibly can. So if they can launch out into their own lives with a sense of the wonder that they came in with, a sense of the joy, the respect, the ability to trust, to see people, to experience what is in front of them, if they can preserve even a bit of it, I'm gonna buy me a big old rocking chair and go find a fishing hole. Um, I don't know why I said that, because I do neither of those two things, but that's okay. There's one other place that I've seen it, greatness. I saw it in the days and weeks following September 11th, 2001. I saw it. I saw people come together with a fierceness and a sense of purpose and a purity that just made me proud to be part of the human race. I saw folks who had killed and hurt and judged each other, let it all melt away that quickly because there was something far more compelling that brought them together. That's greatness. I saw it again following August 29th, 2005, Hurricane Katrina. And I worked at the time for a hotel company that had the gold jewel on the Biloxi, the Gulf Coast, that was the Beau Rivage in Biloxi, Mississippi. The horror was 3,000 employees' lives got swept away that day by that tidal surge. So did the place that provided them their living. Most of them lost their homes. They lost loved ones. They lost it all. And within two days, because that's how greatness works, within two days, despite all the reasons that things couldn't be done, 
There was a private plane that got in there. We set up satellite connection. I'm still not sure how we did that. We had a triage tent set up in what used to be the parking lot of that hotel. And for two weeks that I had the privilege of being there, what I witnessed was greatness time and time again. I saw it when it was inconvenient. I saw it when it didn't make sense. So here's the good news. We don't need to pursue it because it's here. So here's the what if. I have seen your leader's guide, and I got to tell you, that is one slam dunk, super cool diversity leader's guide. Probably the best I've ever seen. Probably the best I've ever seen. So what if we took that plan and made the choice to use as fuel to move it that place where greatness lives? What if we did that? What would that mean for those we intersect with? What would that mean for the teams that we're part of? What would it mean for the organizations that we represent, for the communities in which we live and work, for the society in which we are ultimately a part of? What would it mean? You think it might mean a bit? I think it might. So just imagine what it could be. Now, here it is. I have the GPS coordinates to point you to where that greatness is. You ready? Point to yourself, please. Point to yourself. This is the participatory portion. <laughs> point to yourself, please. Is there anyone out there who is pointing to those spectacular pair of shoes that they knew would make them a better human being. Is there anyone out there that was pointing to the head that has got the Ivy League cred, the sophistication, the knowledge, the intellect? Did anyone point to that head? Did anyone point to the muscles that we have worked so hard to cultivate to show our strength as human beings? Did anyone point to the muscles? No, I know where you pointed to the GPS coordinate that is the bullseye of our greatness. I know, in six minutes, you're welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so it's not so easy, right? We got the greatness, we know where it lives, it lives inside us somewhere. We were born with it, because the one place that we can reliably find it is on that preschool playground. We know it is always in us because when it comes to moments that our heads cannot wrap itself around, what do we do? We default to this place of greatness, right? So what is it that happens between that playground and those moments of crisis? And here's what it is. It's the experiences in our lives that layer upon us a new operating system that then over time conditions us and becomes our default operating system. Sound pretty techy, don't I? I know. It is our head. It is our brain. It is our intellect. And let me give you a sense of just the ferocity of this thing that is our default operating system. 60,000 thoughts a day fly through your brain. 60,000 of them. I'm not sure who counted that, but I respect him or her a lot. Because <laughs> imagine if you lost track, you'd have to start again, like a new day. Wow. 60,000 thoughts a day fly through our heads, and guess what? 75% of them are negative. Yes! 75% of them are negative. So what does that sound like in our heads? Well, it sounds like a lot of things. It sounds like where all judgment comes from. Not this enough, not that enough, not me enough, not same enough, not different enough. All judgment comes from there. You don't see it on a preschool playground. What you see on preschool playgrounds is an, a whole bunch of observing, a whole bunch of observing going on. I love when kids remind me of what it is that I have that I lose sight of. I love it when I remember like a three or four year old girl came to me once and said, wow, why do you have brown gums? I know, brown gums. 
So my head said, she ought not to ask that. <laughs> That's not politically correct. And guess what? Her mother's head went to, oh my goodness, what did my child just do to reflect on me? But you know what? Out of greatness, it was simply a question. It was simply the curiosity that is part of greatness. It was not with judgment. That's what our head does. It's part of those 60,000 thoughts, 75%. It is those thoughts that tell us why we are better than everybody else. It is in here, 60,000 thoughts a day, that we can derive our sense of superiority. I have this credential. I have this position. I have this trophy. I have, I have, I have. That is why I am better than you. It's what our head does. But another part of what our head does, it also reminds us why we're not good enough. Isn't that crazy? I'm not good enough. I won't be smart enough. I won't be worthy enough. I won't fit in enough. 75% of them are negative. So that's the place where our gunny sack lives. That's the place where we have saddlebags. That is the default operating system that is produced for us by every experience we've ever had in our whole lives. Every time I was told my idea was bad, my brain got it. Every time I was told why I was going too far, my brain got it. Every time I was told I didn't fit in properly, my brain got it and it remembered it. And those are the associations, 60,000 thoughts a day, 75% of them are negative, those are the associations that manifest in every interaction that we have. Diversity ain't about pigment. You've heard it a lot. It's not about my gender. It is about every life experience that I have that results in these 60,000 thoughts a day where 75% were negative that put me further away from the greatness that is in me because it was there on the playground. Does that make sense? Yeah. Damn, I wish I knew what to do about it. Um, just kidding. So why is it that, what do we do? What do we do? Kids don't have the challenge of this fierce operating system, this default operating system. Why? Because they don't have the intellect. They don't know better. Have you ever asked a child to just leap into your arms from a piece of furniture? Do you know what they do? They leap. I can't, because my 60,000 thoughts, because I'm a smart intellectual, say mortality, insurance coverage, broken limbs, <laughs> humiliation, wow, whole bunch of din. Uh, have you ever seen children support each other? If you picture two or three kids alongside, Picture them two or three years of age. One starts crying. What do the other two do? They cry. You know why? Because it's really simple. Because greatness makes us all connected. We are all the same in that place of greatness. So your unhappiness is mine too. Your disappointment is mine too. Your pain is mine too. That's what is great about it. Have you ever seen kids self-congratulate? I remember my kids would be sitting there and trying to master the art of insert Cheerio into mouth. Lower level, we might view it as. Don't tell them that. It was a big deal. The orifice isn't that big. The arms aren't so good. It's a lot of work to get that Cheerio inserted. And when they did, they would break out into applause and peals of giggles. And there are so many corporate meetings, I can tell you, that I've been in. And I know what I just witnessed was the act of courage of someone trying to get that Cheerio in their mouth. And when they did it, I wanted to stand up and start squealing and clapping. I've also been in very high level meetings where I know someone is anguished. And all I wanna do is walk over to them and give them a big hug. 
But we don't do those things because we're too smart and we know better, right? Um, the other, and, the, and I think the reason that we don't, in these moments of crisis, which is the other place that we see greatness, in those moments of crisis, what happens then? It's not that we become ignorant, but I gotta tell you, this operating system is not so big. It isn't so sophisticated. It can't manage as much as it thinks it can. So when those moments that are bigger than we are, 9-11, Katrina, the tornadoes that we saw in this country recently, when those things show up, it fries the operating system. It fries it. And what do we do when we don't have that operating system? We go to what is in our core. We re revert back to it, right? Now, I've worked for a couple of bosses who tried to create sufficient crisis to try to keep us in that place. And unfortunately, they just fell short. So all it was was like 211 degree Fahrenheit water. It just got really hot. We never hit the 212th degree to convert steam and make it capable of moving in a locomotive. So you can try to create crisis as a management strategy, but it rarely, rarely works, I will tell you. So I want to share one story with you because this is one um, where if I ever needed a reminder, this is my reminder. I've mentioned that I've got children. I have three of them. I have three that I own. I have six that I claim. Um, and I'll explain that to you in a minute. Because I know your head's going, what she just say? I'm a foster parent three times over. And I've lived um, a profound lesson in destiny because we all found each other and then we stuck together. So I have three adopted children. Um, today, they are age 22, uh, Joseph age going to be in three more sleeps, 14, and my daughter, Tay, is uh, 12. When I met them, Richard was nine, and Joseph was two and a half weeks old, and they came a day apart. So I gave birth essentially to twins a day apart, uh, a nine-year-old twin and a two and a half week old twin. I know, wrap your head around that, if you will. Uh, Richard is beautiful. He's blue-eyed, and his eyes change color depending on what he's wearing. So he looks like he stepped off the streets of London. Joseph is a light-complected African-American man. He actually looks a little like Barack Obama. I think it's the ears. Um, <laughs> but, but that's Joseph. And I had the two boys, and about a year and a half later, my favorite social worker called and said, I think I've met your daughter. And it's a kind of a cool phone call to get. A little bit moving of cheese, but a cool phone call. So she said, go meet her. She's five and a half months of age. She's an African-American girl. All we know is she was tested positive for cocktail street drugs, but you should go interview her. I'm not gonna mess with a social worker because I care about hierarchical structure. So I'm gonna do what she said. So the boys and I went to go interview this five and a half month old. And it wasn't the most fulfilling interview I've ever conducted, but, but we did it. And as we were driving home, I was giving Richard a life lesson, because that's my job as a parent. And what I said to him was, Richard, families are constructs of the heart. You declare them. Sometimes you're born into them, but not always. They're constructs of the heart, and it's a commitment that you make, and it's a commitment forever. So when you go to sleep tonight, I want you to go into your heart and see if you can commit to being her big brother forever. And I will see if I can commit to being her mom. And then we'll chat in the morning. So he at the time was 10. I at the time was older than 10. <laughs> hmm. well, I'm 51. Like, I don't even know why I made a big deal of it, because it isn't. I'm 51, so now I'm going to give you the long pause to go, damn, you look good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, she did say that. So we're at different places, because his operating system is the place of greatness. My operating system is my default intellectual operating system. So we had very different nights. His was one of sleep and serenity, and mine was not. Because mine's 60,000, that night I know turned into 120,000, and I walked all the way through every consideration. Can I afford it? Is it too much? What if we don't match? What if they don't like each other? What if, what if, what if? I got up, I looked like hell. And there was this bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, blonde boy sitting at the table. So I said, well, what'd you come up with, son? He said, you know, she's got Joseph's curly hair. They're both African-American. She's got my eyes. My daughter's eyes are hazel, so they're light colored. And she's about your skin color. 
I think she'd be a perfect fit in our family. <laughs> 30 minutes later, based on his clarity, I went and picked up my daughter. And thank God for Richard, because I would have messed it up. I would have messed it up. So, um, the power of the core. Right? Are you with me so far? You buying that so far? Then let me quantify a little bit more of the power of the core. All of human relation, call it communication, call it interaction, all of it. Of all of it, 7% are the words that we use. And 93% is everything else. Let me say that again. 7% of our ability and our interaction with other people relies upon the things that we say. 93% of our relationship with other people has everything to do with everything we don't. Now, wrap your head around that because 7% is a diversity plan, isn't it? Isn't that what we declare? 7% was Enron's value mission statement, right? How did their 93% stack up? Not so well, right? So the core is powerful, and it's in the 93% that we make all of the conclusions about the integrity of that 7%, isn't it? And here's another way to look at it. The head is the 7%. What comes from our core is the 93%. And whether you call that core your heart, your spirit, your intuition, your gut, it doesn't, I don't, I don't care. But the difference between those is huge. Because this is fierce. It's, it's a din. It's a chaotic kind of place. But you know what? It's also a very limiting place. This is the place that reminds us all the time that we're better than everybody else. It's also the place that reminds us all the time that we're never good enough, right? This is that place. 7%. 93 is everything else. So what we need to do is to wrap our awareness around the 93 percent. And let me go into, into that a little bit. What I, want, what I want to try to do is to encourage you to pick up your own kaleidoscope of perception and just turn it a little bit to see slightly differently what you already see. God bless you. Um, so let me give you uh, another story. My first encounter with prejudice and that's a pregnant pod because it's going to be, don't you think it's going to be a heavy story? Here it is. It was a, a really cool story. I was nine, and I'm the oldest of three daughters, born to parents from India, being raised in Vancouver, British Columbia, in Canada. Solid middle class. My daddy was a professor, and my mother was a stay at home mom. I had it pretty good. Uh, lived in a predominantly white neighborhood. Uh, apparently, I thought I was too. I didn't really think about it, but that's where I. But that one day, third grade, I think, I was walking home from school, and there were kids on the other side of the street, and I could tell that they were trying to hurt me. And I could tell that it had to do with the words that they were using, and I could tell that those words had something to do with the fact that I wasn't white. Act of prejudice, we would call that, right? So I did what I think all human beings do. I started sobbing because it hurts to be seen as different, to be perceived as different words stab, and it hurt. So I went sobbing into the bosom of my awaiting mama, and she hugged me and cajoled me, patted me on the back, and then said what she said a lot, wait till your daddy gets home. <laughs> and then my daddy, the chemical engineering professor, got home, and when she explained to him that I needed a life lesson, he did what he always did. He would pull out his yellow pad, and he would shoot his HB pencil, and I knew I was about to get me a really good science lesson. And that one day, the science lesson that I received was all about the pigments and skin. So he drew me a picture of the epidural layer, showed me how pigment went on top of it, and then I got the <laughs> chemical interaction between the sun and pigment, and I got it, I got it. Pigment is science, I understood the science. And then he pushed the yellow pad away and said, now, let me tell you about how it is that we are crazy human beings. 
and he painted this amazing picture, not literally, but he painted this amazing picture, and the picture was, in front of God, he said, there are lots and lots of different lineups, and each of those lineups correspond to the gift or skill that he's gonna give the people in that lineup, and how much of any particular gift or skill you receive simply depends upon how much time he has when you get to the head of the lineup. So, Punim, there was a lineup for pigments. And you were in that lineup. And when you got to the head of that lineup, boy, was he glad to see you. Oh, he spent lots of time just gifting you. And I got it. And then just to make sure that he anchored it in, contrast is good, right? So he used the example of Melissa Branion, my very best friend. She is a beautiful redhead. Gorgeous redhead, so complected. And I gotta tell you that when Melissa and I were out playing and it was sunny, I could all but hear the freckles on her face <laughs> pop, right? So my father explained to me that when she got to the head of that lineup, he was a little bit busy. So instead of the time and gift I received, he said to her, Melissa, nice to see you, I love you, next. <laughs> and that's what she got. I got it. Uh, back in that day, we still had show and tell, so I had something I, I needed to show and tell, and I did. And it so confused my teachers, I called my house. <laughs> because what they reported was this, this unbelievably proud human being thrust her arms out in the air during show and tell and proclaimed herself to be the world's largest freckle. To this day, world's largest freckle. I know, it just makes me feel like special. But here was the other thing, and, and my father didn't tell me that, but I've certainly learned it, I think, over time. Um, we are the only animals in the entire kingdom that uh, were given gifts and skills with free agency and free will. We're the only member of the animal kingdom to have free agency and free will. And if I can convert that into the mental picture of a volume control on our gifts, then I can explain to you that there is no such thing ever as a weakness. There just isn't. Because th there's nothing in that factory that creates weakness. All the lineups are for skills and gifts. So we are gifted skills and gifts in a really unique and special combination we are given free agency and free will. We're given the volume control to use those gifts and skills. So here's what happens. I believe one of the things that I was gifted with was determination. I am be determined. But when I've got that blaring a little bit too loud, it means I get a bit stubborn. I believe I've been gifted with the ability to speak. But you know what? When I too loudly, it means I don't listen. The leadership challenge for all of us is to help everyone within our circle of influence get completely enthusiastic, fully aware of every skill and gift that has been given to them. That's our job. And then we become coaches to help them guide their volume. Does that make sense? We buy that. This would be a good time to say, yes, we buy that. <laughs> wow, I gotta be there for you, it's a good thing I'm there. Um, so the other thing that is factory issued and therefore flawless, because in the factory that we are made from, there are no rejects, there, it's only flawless products. So here it is. It is that place of greatness, it is that intuition, it is that gut, and the very fancy name that I am going to use to describe it from this point forward is, it is a BS-ometer. So I would submit to you that we, when we come in, are factory issued a flawless BS-ometer. And we use that every single day of our lives, from even on that playground, all the way through. It is flawlessly taking reads on where we are being dealt with sincerely, and conversely, when we are being dealt with with no sincerity. It is a BSometer, it is flawless. So if we acknowledge that, here's what happens. The threshold of accountability gets very high. 
because you can fool me with your 7%, that is your words, but you know what? I'm always going to read it with my BSometer. I got full accountability for that 93% that aren't your words. You know why? Because I got me a factory issued BSometer. And I will tell you the truth, I've had the experience of when I've actually gone to open my mouth to try to make a case and I don't even buy it. My own BSometer is going, nice try, nice try. I'm like, let me just fancy up the words. Let me start to do a bit of this. Maybe they'll buy it then. Well, guess what? On that 93% that are not our words, there is no getting around it. It is the highest standard. It is full, true accountability. So what I would suggest and observe is when we talk about diversity, the accountability that we need to address and come to grips with as leaders is the high bar threshold of our BSometers. And unless we pass it, let's not even start. Because 7% are the words, and here's what it sounds like. Wah, 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 wah. Right? Haven't we been in organizations where all of a sudden, new thing, wah, 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 TQM, wah, 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 wah. Customer service, wah, wah, wah. Well, guess what? We, none of us, I don't think, have intentionally said, I want to really hire only dumb people. Right? We say we're picking the best in our organizations. Only the strongest and smartest and best get through to get a job in our organizations. Well, that's true, isn't it? So if you hire smart people, they got greatness in them, and what they're going to immediately do is that BSometer is going to get the rules down. So I get the rules very clearly as an employee. If you say to me, Customer service matters, but it's always about the budget. I get it. I got the rules. The rules are when there's money left over, spend a little on customers. I get it. It's not what the policy says. Policy says customer service is us. But the BS owner knows the real deal, and the real deal is when there's money left over. So that's the burden and the opportunity for all of us is we gotta just recognize that the accountability is at that level, very high, of the BSometer. And we've got it in us, so we know. So, sincerity of intention is what it's about. There's three things, and I know you've been talking about. One, business case. I just wanna talk a bit about the business case, but looking through the filter of this new standard of accountability, that is the high bar of the BSometer. Second, plans. We talk a lot about diversity plans, Im implementation. I just wanna quickly touch on that through this new filter of accountability that is the BSometer. And then finally, dashboard metrics. We talk a lot about that in diversity. Got to measure. Doesn't count unless we measure. But then let's just run it through that filter of accountability and just make sure that we still believe it the same way. Business case. I looked at uh, the diversity guide, and you've got five reasons. Anyone know them off by heart right now? Raise your hands. The guy who wrote them, <laughs> Colonel Barry. Here are the five of them. Right thing to do, organizational policy, changing demographics, build safe and productive work environments, impact on ability to perform the mission. Those are good reasons, but can I just observe with as a, bu a bunch of love, one of you remembered them. Hmm. I wouldn't yet go out and start promoting them, because unless your BSometer reads it true and registers deep and committed sincerity of intention, you will sound like Charlie Brown's teacher. And they love you, they're not gonna tell you that. They will smile and nod, and then they will turn and go back to the way the rules really are. Because that's what we do, right? So let's talk about business case. Those are the fives. I'm gonna just um, challenge you to define the business case in a way that works for you. Define it in a way that gets your gut motivated and moved. And I'm gonna give you some examples. MGM, 70,000 employees, this was a big company. Uh, publicly traded companies, so shareholder value was the reason that we existed. Kermit the Frog sang about the color that had to count in diversity at MGM, and the color he sang about was green. So the reason that we showed up as 70,000 people every day to go to work may not have been so righteous or noble, but the reason we showed up is we had to return re shareholder value. That was our job. So it had to tie to that, right? It had to tie to that. If we declared it as a mission imperative, the BSometer says, oh yeah, show me, show me. 
So here's what it meant. We talked about two reasons. Inside the building, employees, and outside the building, customers. Those were the two halves of the diversity reason. And let me give you some of it. We talk about changing demographics all the time. Minority, majority. That's what this state's going to be. That's what our schools are in this state already. So minority, majority. But can I just observe that minority and majority strung together are confusing. Either I'm a minority or I'm a majority. How can I be both? Doesn't make sense. So what we started to, to talk about was emerging markets, emerging segments, emerging segments of employees, emerging segments of leaders, emerging segments of everything. It was about the possibility, because I want to pursue a possibility, right? So Colonel Barry actually was our um, diversity, I don't even know what to call you. He was our diversity consultant, but he was really our spiritual guide. And he was the BSometer that was in every meeting with arms and legs. That's it, you're a BSometer with arms and legs. Oh, don't get them started, please. Man. I'm gonna, don't get started, please. Um, but one of the things that he brought to us very early, and we shared it to, with 70,000 people because it was so powerful, was this African, the Ubuntu tribe's custom, Sawabona. And this is what two members of this tribe would do when they encountered each other. Very simply, Sawabona would say, translates literally into, I see you. The response is Sikona, equally literally translates into, therefore, I am here. And what's so powerful about that is it, it is through the act of seeing me as a human being with my greatness in all of my dimensions, with the chaos of my 60,000 thoughts, that act of seeing me in all those dimensions is what allows me to exist. Does that make sense? Okay. And then the other thing that we used to talk a lot about was the biology of the human brain. Only 9% of the human brain is able to flash or fire at any instant in time. Did you know that? 9%, that's it. It doesn't matter how old you are, how smart you are, what you ate for breakfast, turns out nothing matters. 9% of the human brain is able to flash or fire at any instant in time. That was a science lesson I got from my dad. Here was the wisdom. So when you're making big decisions, always make sure you have at least 10 other people around the table because you're worth a whole brain. And what I didn't realize all those years ago when he was giving me that science lesson and that wisdom is he was drawing for me the bullseye of diversity in the workplace. That's what it is. I am a woman of color. I know that. But I work way too hard, way too hard, to be given any amount of credit for the two things I have no control over. See me in my dimensions. I am a mother. I fear a lot of stuff. There are scary, skinny branches that I'm not sure I'm good enough to take on. I am all of those things. See me. When you see me, I exist. And when I exist, I am in, I am all in, I will walk a mile over broken glass for you. So let's talk about outside the building. This is about market edge, fiercely competitive business, the hotel business, especially the Las Vegas Strip, hugely competitive. So here's how it looked. The business is to extend an invitation responsibility is to deliver with sincerity on the promise that you make. Don't invite me to your door and then have nothing for me to eat. That's rude. Don't invite me to your home and then have pictures that offend me on the walls. That's silly. Right? That was the work of diversity. So I'll give you very specific examples. Um, Beau Rivage, Biloxi, Mississippi. It turns out that property president said, hmm, I have a gorgeous property knows that there's a lot of very affluent African Americans within a, you know, the immediate the states that surround Mississippi. And I want to get a disproportionate share of that business. Sounds great. So I go to Biloxi, Mississippi, and we're going to build a plan to get this done. While I'm there, in my suite, there's a table tent. And it announces for me the upcoming entertainment lineup, Beau Rivage in Biloxi, Mississippi. 
and with great enthusiasm and some really beautiful artwork, we are promoting John Tesh and Meatloaf. Um, okay, invite me, but don't honor me. Don't see me in all my dimensions. My daughter is African American, so I have just enough knowledge about black hair to be completely dangerous. I'm down in the gift shop, and guess what I noticed? Bottles of head and shoulders, the little ones, and those green bottles of perk shampoo. And here's what I know, that does not honor African American hair. Am I right? All right. So easy. The 7% is easy. It was really easy to sit down with the advertising agency and say, let's build the ads. Let's build the brochures. Let's extend the invitation. Let's buy the radio time. Easy. 7%. Done. But it's that 93% that the world detects because we do. And that is around the sincerity of the intention. If I'm going to extend the invitation, I have got to accept the responsibility to deliver with sincerity on the promise that I make. Beauvage, that was, and you know what? He did it. He did it, and he was an enlightened white guy. They're my favorite kind. He said, this is about the green, this is about the team's success. Here's what we will do. We will not run those ads until we are ready. And then we did a complete sweep of that property. Everything, everything. Restaurant menus, the colors, the music in the elevators, the shows, you name it, it was transformed. But you know what? It wouldn't have worked had it just been him and me in the conversation. Because even though I got a lot of stuff in God's lineups, I do not have the awareness of what it means to be African American. And neither did he. So it wasn't about completing an EEO form to say, let's build a committee to get all the requisite perspectives. It was about getting all of the 9% brains at the table so we could have whole brain thinking, right? Let me give you an example of one occasion where the MGM organization did it badly. The MGM Grand, the very big green building in the middle of the strip, right? When it was originally built, I don't know if any of you can remember or were here or saw pictures. To walk in, beautiful building, world's biggest at the time it was constructed. The entrance statement was grand. It was the head of a lion through which we all got to walk to get into the magnificent green building. Anyone remember that or see that? It was beautiful. This, I mean, you came in the big old lips of the lion and over its tongue and through its esophagus, I guess, I'm not sure. I don't know how they designed it, but I wasn't there when it was built. But that's what we did, and guess what? One of the key market segments was the Asian market. So let me play back, using slightly different words, what the company just did. Please, Asians from Asia, please, we extend the invitation, please come and stay at our property. Travel 19 hours to get here so that we can paralyze you at the door. Why? Because it turns out it's incredibly inauspicious in every Asian culture to walk into the mouth of the beast. Oopsie daisy. Oopsie daisy. We did it badly, right? Not a whole brain thinking. There weren't any values of diversity considered in that thinking. Less than best result. So what do you do? You spend millions of dollars to get that whole big beautiful mouth up so that you can immediately spend millions of dollars to tear that whole mouth down. The next time you ever have occasion to drive down Las Vegas Boulevard, look at that green building. There's this beautiful, respectful, demure little lion way off on the left side. Yeah. So that's about the business case. You got to believe it. So there are five that are in your manual. Look at the five. Do any one of them inspire any kind of curiosity in you? Do any one of them get your juices flowing? Do any one of you resonate with you? It's never the words. It's in the 93% that is not your words. Find that business case. Because it doesn't matter what the case is. I follow people. I don't follow their 7% of their words. Right? We will go to the death for people we believe in. The ideas and the words come and go, we know that. So you've got to find a way to believe it here, not just here.
Because if you do, you will inspire people. If you do, you will transform teams, organizations. And if you can't, the BSometer is going to pick it up. So spend time on the business case. Two, let's talk about implementation plans. Um, they need to be real. They need to be tactical, practical, and fluid. Give you some, uh, some examples. As we were building Bellagio, big monster hotel in the Las Vegas Strip, someone observed that there were zero African-American dealers. Dealers as in, not car dealers, but those that make a lot of money in tips dealing cards. The position pays about $85,000, $9,000 a year. It's a great position, and you know what? There weren't any. So it would have been easy to say, we're racist. But you know what? Sincerity of intention was what it was about. So that made everybody curious. It just is what it is. We don't need to judge it or blame around it. We just need to be better, because that's the sincerity of the intention. So what we did is looked at who had applied for those positions. And guess what? Zero African-American applicants. Hmm. Now that curiosity gets even bigger, go the next level. We went to dealers' schools. These are the places where you get certified to be a dealer. And we said, who are you graduating? And the answer is zero African-Americans. Like, wow, now, like, Curiosity is through the roof. We went to the African-American community and said, why? Why? And you know what? The answer was simple. Las Vegas is considered the Mississippi of the West. Sammy Davis Jr. was a performer whose name would be bigger than lights on the marquee, but he was forced to enter the building through the back door. That was in this lifetime. There are people still alive today that remembered that, that had to walk through those back doors. I get it. So what they said, even a generation, the next generation, what they said was, why would we invest to go to school, to get a certificate, to apply for a place that we don't think we'll ever get, and we might even be royally disrespected in the process? Why would we do that? I'm like, good point. That would be a pretty foolish proposition for you to accept. So here's what we did. The plan was we got with African-American churches, because pulpits are where things happen in the African-American culture. That's what I know. So we partnered with them and we said, okay, you recruit from the pulpits. We partnered then with the community college and said, here are the training specs to which you will train. And then we looked at the applicants and said, here's the deal. If you pass specs, you have a guarantee of a job at Bellagio. Now that's a proposition that makes some sense for an intelligent person, doesn't it? The number of people that started from that program at Bellagio and Bellagio has been open, I think, 13 years. It's a 3% turnover rate. Because when you say to me, I see you in all of your dimensions, and I honor that, I'm in it. I am in it. I am connected. I am there. And that's what we've got. But that's an example of what a plan needs to be. Right? And we just said we're going to run an ad saying, black dealers, please, we'll give you a line pass at the, at the employment office. You know, we could have ticked it off. We could have felt good. That would have been a 7% 7, 7 satisfaction. But at no level does that rise to meet the standard of accountability that is the BSometer, right? Um, policy review. That was one of the things that we said. Sawabona. Colonel Barry gives us Sawabona. We want to see people so that they know they exist with us. So part of what that re represented for us at MGM was we had to do a policy review. What are all of the policies that we have in place that may get in our way, that may not be saying we see you in all your dimensions, honor you in all your dimensions. So here's what we did. We looked at domestic partner benefits. Oh, we didn't have any. Oops. We honor you except for the part that is in a committed relationship at the base of your life. That's the part we choose not to see. That didn't make sense. So we put in domestic partner benefits. We looked at adoption benefits. I happen to have a family that is differently created. And so we put in an adoption benefit. Very few people take advantage of it. But I got to tell you, one of the largest responses that I received to any change that we made was to that. Because what family said is, we have never really felt like we were any kind of family because nobody views us as a family. When the company provided an adoption benefit, all you did was affirm that I mattered. Profound, right? Um, the other thing, and, and I will share this with you because I wish you could have been there, uh, military benefits. So the boss said to us, 
let's understand what we're doing with military benefits. So of course, you know, we're Corp Fortune 300. There's an army of people. We all got together and we did PowerPoint presentations. I mean, our 7% was done at a 200% level. And we went in with three different scenarios, A, B, and C, each with its own deck. We were rehearsed and who was gonna say what and when it was gonna get done. And we got 30 or 40 seconds into it and the boss said, that's enough. 30 or 40 seconds into it, what was our 30 or 45 minute long presentation? And he said, here's what we're gonna do. For any employee of ours who is serving, for as long as they're gone, we're gonna pay them in full. We're gonna terminate and discontinue nothing and let them know that their job is waiting for them when they get back because that's what we need to do. I know. I know. I was insanely proud of that man that day. Um, it also meant that we are, MGM received the Freedom Award. And so actually there are three companies in this entire state, Freedom Award recipients. I have worked for two of them. So I hope there's a causal connection, but there isn't. <laughs> it's a glorious, coincidence. Um, but you know what? That Freedom Award, that action has paid back in ways I can't even begin to tell you for the company. It is a strong magnet to hire best and brightest. The level of commitment, allegiance, stick to itiveness that we enjoy out of the members who have served, come back, and known that they were never invisible, it matters. It matters. So that's what I mean. When we talk about plans, it's not about what we say. It's not about what we write down. It's about how we show up. So make sure that whatever the plans are that you've got, have them based on curiosity. Make them real. Make them ta tactical. Make them matter. Because when they do, you will inspire followership. And that's the whole point. And then finally, the dashboard, the metrics. Let's talk about this. Measure things that give you a whole picture. Don't only measure what you gotta. But I'm here to tell you it's important to measure what you gotta. But I also want you to get really curious and measure what you wanna know. I wanna know where my canaries are in the mine. I also wanna know where the kudos need to be delivered. Right? It is a whole picture. Culture is a big, hairy, fuzzy, difficult, less than fully empirical set of, set of issues, right? So it becomes different. I mean, I wish I could say, here's the probe, insert it here, and you will get a flawless read on the culture. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. But I tell you what, if you show me a whole bunch of gauges that represent a bunch of reads on different teams, I can tell you where the healthy teams are. Because the healthy teams are the ones who have lower absenteeism in addition to better EEO numbers. The healthy teams are the ones that have greater volunteerism showing up than others. That's where you see fewer hotline calls, right? Greater employee stock participation. It's the little things, but in the aggregate, they give you a picture of where you've got engaged people, where BSometers are reading truth, where we are committed, where we're showing up. Conversely, I can also look at gauges and show you the teams in distress. I can show you the teams where communication's gone, trust is long out the window, folks are living in fear, there's invisible numbers of folks coming into work every day. I can see those teams, and I can see them by a whole bunch of different gauges. So be careful what you measure. You got to measure what you got to measure, but don't just stop there. Be curious. Look at it all. Look at it all, and you'll start to see some really powerful things. Okay, ready? Execute your diversity strategy with the awareness of that 93%. Execute your diversity strategy with the awareness of this invisible, yet ubiquitous, yet insanely high bar of accountability, because that's what we got to do. Sorry about that bad news, huh? Um, when you link to the greatness in your core, you will put a motor on your flywheel we talk a lot about flywheel. Put a motor on that. And that motor is going to be because of the power that comes from fuel at our core. When you are doing that, what you're doing is you're granting permission to people to be themselves. You are seeing folks in all of their dimensions for exactly who they are. You are not relegating or cubbyholing me for the two things I have no control over. You honor me for my fears. You help me get complete.
get me in touch with my strengths, and then you coach me to find my volume control. That's what we do. That's what great leaders do. And when you are doing that, you are transforming your culture. But let me also observe, you are also creating your legacy. I want to finish up with one story. Um, but let me set it up for you. The average life expectancy in this country today is 78.1 years. Did you know that? 78.1. I don't know why we got 0.1. We did. Um, and so I did the math, not in my head. I had to use a calculator because I'm a special ed teacher. So my math is 65.8%. So if I round it up, here's my news, is I am at two-thirds. And if I were an hourglass, that would mean that two-thirds of the sand of my life's hourglass were going to be in the bottom, and only one-third of that sand would remain It's a little over 25,500 days. It creates in me a real sense of urgency. It creates in me a real sense of, whew, there's a puny amount of sand there. What am I going to do with that day? What am I going to do with that day? I had the privilege of working for a man named Terry Lanny. He was the chairman and CEO of MGM during the heydays of uh, diversity at MGM. March of 2007. I had a conversation with him in his office. He'd only asked me a few months before that to be, to change the name of my department. I was doing community affairs and government relations. And he said to me, Grasshopper, he didn't actually call me Grasshopper, I just added that. Um, <laughs> he said to me, Grasshopper, will you take on diversity? And I remember at the time, I was raising a family where I could not get over the fact that anyone was going to actually pay me to live my highest passion. Because I got me a family based on Richard's clarity. So that was a gift. And I said to him, yes, of course I will. Thank you for that opportunity. But at one point I had a conversation with him, and it was my way of expressing my bs -ometer question. And what I said to him was, Terry, why do you care so much? Where is this thing that I sense is real, but where, why? Because from my perspective, if I'm gonna hook my wagon to his hiney, I wanna make sure that I trust that hiney. And let me just observe, that was the least poetic picture <laughs> I have ever painted. <laughs> he said to me is, I don't know. He said, I don't know. But what a powerfully interesting question. So let me get back to you. Now, I like a guy that tells me the truth, and my bs honor knew that that was the truth. He didn't try to shuck and jive and say, let me give her my best 7%. Instead, he had a birthday. He was a twin, and he and the twin brother were taken to Hawaii by their wives for the 60th birthday. And the birthday present for that 60th birthday in the hotel room was their best of six decades on videotape, on a CD probably. And there was one picture that came up in that montage of photographs representing six decades, one photograph that he saw and it all fell into peace for him, into place. So he comes back from Hawaii and he says to me, I've got your answer. Do you remember that question that you asked me? I have your answer. I said, what is the answer? He said, Julie Cunningham. I said, who's Julie Cunningham? He said, Julie Cunningham was in my school. She was part of my first communion. And when I saw that picture of that first communion, it all came back. So here's the setting. Half a century before the conversation we were having, Terry Lanny, boy of privilege, Beverly Hills, California, twins going to a she-she private school. I don't think that was the name of it. I just called it that. The school had a policy, the policy at the school was any teacher at the school could enroll their child for free, and the tuition was significant, so that was a significant perk. Coach Cunningham was a member of that staff at that school, and Coach Cunningham had Julie Cunningham. That was his daughter, and like every father, Coach just wanted more for his child. So he signed Julie up. 
and there was a maelstrom, a firestorm of controversy at that school. And you know what happened? Half of those students and the parents yelling loudest stood up and said, if that black girl comes into my school, my kids are leaving. And on the other half, led by Mr. and Mrs. Laney, was the choir of Kansas said, if Julie Cunningham is denied the ability to come to the school, not only are we leaving, we're taking all of our kids with us. That charge on this side was led by Mr. and Mrs. Laney. And what Terry Laney remembered when he saw that picture was that moment, that day of that first communion where they were all lined up, filed into the auditorium. They were stood for the several hundred kids in this group picture. And you had to see it. They were wearing white gowns with white hats. Sea of little white faces. And then there she was, this dark, dark, complected, beautiful little thing named Julie Cunningham. When Terry saw that on that best of six decades of my life, he knew that that's what diversity meant to him. Powerful, powerful. It reduced me to tears. It felt like a moment of intimacy with a human being, unlike few that I've experienced. Intimacy, meaning not sexual, into me, you, see. The ultimate act of courage is to let another human being see us in all of our dimensions. My chairman had just given me that gift. I said to him, will you say something? 70,000 people, that's what we need to know. That's what's gonna fuel us. And he didn't, and he wouldn't, until he did. And when he did, it was black entertainment television. And the night that he did, it was because he was being gifted, presented a very special chairman's award, and it was nationally broadcast. And completely without notice, in his accepting that, he paid tribute to Julie Cunningham. And in doing that, he shared with the world what had happened. Well, that was on a Saturday night, Monday morning. His phone rang, and it was a bunch of Cunninghams around the country. <laughs> and they said to me, we think we know Julie. And that freaked him out, so he called me, and he said, I don't know, can you figure out who she is? Turned out her name was Julie Payne. Turned out she lived in Las Vegas. 50 years later, that's where they'd last seen each other. Coach Cunningham went on to have a total of nine kids. Julie was the oldest. They moved to Las Vegas. They lived only a little bit apart. Julie Payne was the drug czar for the state of Nevada. So in another job, I knew Julie Payne. Unbelievable. So here's another human being's experience of that exact same moment. I've got three seconds left. Is there like, does something open and swallow me up? Or? <laughs> I just want to know if it hurts, that's all. <laughs> Nothing. I, I mean, some of you are packing pieces, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. Um, Keep going. Julie Payne remembers that day. Terry's experience was I was in white, there was a big deal about Julie, we had the picture, my parents took a stand, how cool was that? That was powerful for him. Here was Julie Payne's experience, Julie Cunningham's experience. I am waiting in that very long lineup, and I know I'm a problem. I wished that the floor could have opened up and swallowed me. That's what I wanted to have happen. And I remember standing there, and the woman the parents of the child behind me said, my daughter ain't not standing behind no black girl. That's the memory seared into Julie Cunningham's brain. She remembers that picture. She wanted it to be over. She remembered that moment because it hurts her 50 years later. And can I just ask you to wonder what it felt like for her to know that a half century later, that moment of intense humiliation, pain, invisibility, she got to reframe as she realized that she became the catalyst of something that transformed an organization of 70,000 people. Terry Lanny died last year. Um, 
But you know what? It's the work of legacy, isn't it? Because there's everything that was written about him. I was so proud that everything that was written about the man in the wake of his passing, in the wake of his passing, that's a really weird way to put stuff, isn't it? It's kind of like too much funeral talk in the wake of his passing. Sorry, sometimes humor helps me get through the parts that are feeling awkward, right? Um, but everything that was written about him to honor and celebrate his amazing life, tighten the business, hugely successful. But what I was so Im immensely proud about was that diversity was the largest imprint that he recognized and acknowledged for. So never underestimate it. Um, there's a man whose name I don't know. And he was a man who was working at the Excalibur Hotel. And I was there one day during all these years, and my job was to make a big old speech to the employees to get them rabble-roused and enthusiastic. Now, that's what I do. So I was there. As I was leaving, this man, whose name I can't remember, but who I will carry with me forever, came up to me in a very broken English. He said to me, I, I've, been to I've taken HVAC training. Here's what I understood. I'm a father. I have dreams. I have aspirations. I have what it takes. I just need to be seen. That's what I got. And here was the degree of exertion required of me. I called HR with his name. He used to come and see me, and he would bring his two kids with him into my office. He would just stand outside and just wave. They would come by spontaneously and they would leave me cards with the pictures of the two boys and these adorable, almost legible names. Uh, that's a ripple. That's a ripple. All I did was make a call. Never underestimate the power of you. For me, in a day, was a moment of transformation for a life. For Julie Cunningham, a moment of desperate pain was a catalyst for profound transformation for an entire 70,000 member organization. That's the work of legacy. And if we've only got 25,500 days, damn it, let's go down using every single one. Let's divine through every day, through every decision that we make. Let's divine it in a way that whose heart can I touch? Who can I make visible? It ain't about the EEOC. It isn't about my pigment. It isn't about my gender. It's about my humanity. We've known it. We've always known it. We will never forget it because it was on that playground that all of us were on. And it's there in those moments of crisis when we need it most. So I would say to you, my favorite quote in the whole world is simply this. There is no greater power on earth than the human spirit on fire. I wish I could bring all 300 million of us onto this stage because what I want to say to all of you is thank you. I want to thank you for what you do. I want to thank you for why you do it. I want to thank you for who you are. And I want to just remind and challenge you to go to that place of greatness. Don't pursue it, just accept it. Just see it, just support it in us. Because if we do that, we won't just change the team. We won't just change mission readiness. We're gonna transform this world. Thank you. I think you can all see why we uh, saved her for last. Uh, 
I can't thank Poonam enough for sharing what you did. Uh, I know it uh, rocked me to my fiber and my core. And uh, I think everybody in this room is, hasn't been untouched by the words that she said. And uh, we all need to go forward, take her words to heart, take her plan to heart as we go forward on this journey of diversity together. Um, General McKinley started this journey for us, um, or redefined the journey for us that so many before have gone and tried to get going. And I think we're well on our way. Hopefully this conference has given you some tools for diversity and inclusion. And we, the, I can guarantee you the JDAC will continue to find those best practices out there to toolkits and to bring them forward to you. And it may or may not be through a conference, but we'll get them to you. And through Andre's efforts, and through the rest of uh, his office efforts with Shirley and Phyllis and the rest of the members of the JDAC, um, we're going to get there. But we all know it's a journey, it's not a destination. So with that, I'll turn it back to Colonel Barry so, for some closing remarks. Okay, and don't y'all be y'all don't y'all be down now because <laughs> <laughs> sit back up. You know, uh, uh, as I, I uh, as I think back as we kind of come to the end here, there's just a few things you just have to understand that um, one of the mandates from the chief uh, last year was to really do something. First of all, that really. Uh, targeted and hit the senior leadership. And he said, because at the end of the day, we can do great things, we can have a great experience, but if we don't touch the senior leaders, it's really kind of being done in vain. And it's so important to him that we just be, you know, relentless about whatever it took to find what, it, what strategy, what mechanism, what people, what consultants, whatever, to make this happen. I've, I've said this to him uh, many times. Uh, I said, this is your legacy. I said, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, he's the first, you know, person from the National Guard, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and, you know, he's just broke all kind of records. But at the end of the day, it's his legacy. And if there's anything that he's very passionate about, is this thing called diversity. And, um, you know, and, and, and I hope I don't get out of line by saying this, but sometimes I think, uh, if you remember what he said, uh, this is the heart thing. And if you have not been touched by the impact of what diversity means for some people, in terms of their ability to just be the best that they can be. Don't judge me by the content of my character, my, my color, my skin. Judge me by who I am, what's on the inside. And so that's what's so important to him. And, and that's why when you heard him today, he didn't really want to talk from notes. He wanted to talk from his heart because uh, he promises before he leaves here, he's going to do whatever it takes to make sure that this organization is, bet is better as a result of the time he has been here. So having said that, uh, you know, what is shame? What a tragedy if we walk away from here and go back to our respective locations without having done something to make a difference, without having done something to make an impact. You know, uh, this is a time that you, it requires a boldness. And uh, this is, you know, I, I think some of you know, I had a long career in law enforcement. But out of all the things I did in law enforcement, you know, this was the hardest thing I ever got involved in because it hit to the core, hit on people's emotions, it hit people's lives. It was about hope. It was about a chance. It was about an opportunity. It was about, you know, being looked at as being a whole person. So, and still, I believe, for the Guard, the National Guard, this is one of the hardest things we do. Hands down, it's the hardest things we do. Because if it was as simple as a leader's guide or as simple as a strategic plan or as simple as, you know, uh, some kind of strategy, we would have this nailed. But at the end of the day, if people aren't right on the inside, if they don't have a serious commitment to change on the inside, if they haven't stood on the side of themselves and turned and looked at themselves on the inside and said, on my watch, things are going to be different. When I go back, how dare I not go and do something that's never been done before? And we are in, I think what's said today, we're in the era of consequences. 
And uh, I believe Churchill said that. So I just ask everyone to keep those things in mind. Uh, you know, inaction is habit forming. It really is. And when I don't do anything, it's just habit forming. So I, I, I thought about this. I had to come up with a saying one time. And here's basically I just said, Diver diversity will define my generation. I believe it will. When they go back and look at us, it will define our generation. And I'll just say this for those of you who, those of you who have nieces and nephews and, and children, remember this. They will see a future you will never see. They will see a future you will never see. If you're blessed, you're, you will go before your children, but they will see something that you will never see. And have we prepared them on this topic for a world that is going to be dramatically different than the way it is today? So I'll just have a couple of announcements and I'll get you out of here. I just ask, first of all, to keep this in mind that um, when it uh, comes to getting out of here today, is first of all, if everybody has not filled out the survey, uh, as you walk out, just, just raise your hands and there will be people at the back who will collect your surveys and who will take your surveys. If you do not get a CD, uh, there's two types of CDs. There's a gold CD that has all the sessions, all the handouts, all the PowerPoints on the gold CD. If you have the, I believe it's a silver, silver CD, it will have the intermediate and the fundamental tracks, but not all of them. All the materials from this conference, if you go to this website, you can get all the materials. It's ngb.diversity.org, ngb.diversity.org. And um, last thing that, I, that, that, that I'm going to read to you, and we will be done. And I also want to say this. On behalf of the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, I just like saying that. I just like saying that. It's just like, that's just good stuff. Um, this was written in the 1800s. And it says, I have come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element. It is my personal approach that creates the climate. It is my daily mood that makes the weather. I possess tremendous power to make life miserable, joyous. I can be a, to a tool of torture or instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or honor, hurt or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis is escalated or de-escalated, and a person humanized or dehumanized. If we treat people as they are, we make them worse. If we treat them as they ought to be, we help them become what they are capable of becoming. I don't know if anybody here remembers the movie Fight Club. I started this, this conference by saying, if your memories are bigger than your dreams, your life is in trouble. But there's a scene from the movie Fight Club, if you've never seen this movie with Brad Pitt, remember that movie with Brad Pitt? And he goes in the convenience store, remember that? You know, y'all know Brad, Brad Pitt, you know, looking tough and everything, he walks in there, and there's a convenience store clerk, and he sees them, he sees this kid there, and uh, he goes and he puts a gun to his head, but not to take money, to challenge him. And he says, what is your dream? Or what was your dream? And this young kid didn't know what he was talking about. He said, what was your dream? And he says, I'm just a kid working at a convenience store, living in a basement apartment. You know? And he says, no, I want to know what your dream was. And the kid was still confused by this. And he says, I'm just trying to get through life. And he cocks the gun back as he prepares to shoot him. And he says, what was your dream? And he says, to be a veterinarian. And he says, I have your ID. You have six weeks. I know where you live. If you don't turn your life around and take action to go after your dream, I will come and hunt you down. What's the moral of the story? What is your dream with diversity? Because we, if, when it's a matter of life and death, you should choose life. And what we do, as a National Guard is we give people life. So on behalf of the members of this organization, I challenge you to live your dream. And I say, as I say as I walk out of here, if you have not met, where's, where's Ms. Larrabee's crew at? I don't know, they're, they're probably hiding somewhere, but those are for, there's one back there at the door, that's the king of, king of keeping me straight, Allison, and there's Jennifer, all of her staff, I want you to give them a whole huge, huge round of applause. Huge round of applause. Huge. There's Miss Larrabee back there. There she is back there. Huge round of applause. I'm telling you, her staff is phenomenal. Huge round of applause. There they are back there. So make sure you thank them for what they've done. Be careful. 
Great conference. See you next time. Thank you very much.